Good evening. Welcome to the Magnus. My name is George Breslauer. I've had the honor of serving the last four years as director of the Magnus. And um, a remarkable time it's been for me. I came out of retirement to serve as director to conduct public, public relations and fundraising for the Magnus. I'm not a Judaica expert. My specialty is Russian politics. I can talk about Jews in the Soviet Union, but uh, uh, that's about the extent of my expertise in this area. Uh, but we have a curatorial staff of world-class stature that uh, does the creative work that makes the Magnus what it is. And uh, I'll be introducing our head curator uh, in a moment. But I wanted to draw your attention to the magazine that is on every one of your seats, and please take it with you. Uh, this is our annual publication called Confluence, and uh, we've, we've had one come out every year since, I think, 2011 or 12. And uh, if you just leaf through it, it's a visual feast, uh, a visual feast of artifacts from our collection, of photographs by Roman Vishniak, of uh, discussions of our exhibitions. So it is a visual feast as well as an intellectual feast. And leaf through it for the photographs first to just draw you in to the ethos of the confluence and then start reading the explanations and start reading the descriptions and read the discussion between Francesco Spagnolo, our curator, and Professor John Efron of the History Department about the significance of the Roman Vishniak uh, archive. Uh, what I've come to realize is that the Magnus is a repository of cultural memory. It, by, through its collections and through its exhibitions, it sustains or retains cultural memory and communicates that memory to those from the campus, students, staff, and faculty, as well as the more general community who come to learn more, to make witness, to simply enjoy uh, this cultural feast that we try to put on for you. But cultural memory is more than just a visual and intellectual feast. It is a, it is a, a necessity for a community's ongoing health. Uh, you, you know in our lobby, you see the tile mosaic from Camp Swig. In remembrance, it says, quote, in remembrance is the secret of redemption. And we're remembering in the, in the, the uh, Magnus collection, not just the Holocaust, uh, important as it is to remember that, but the span of Jewish history. You see in the, in the piece de resistance uh, uh, exhibition out there that this focus on Jewish resistance to oppression is scanning from Roman times to the 20th century. So remembering our cultural heritage or Jewish cultural heritage uh, is, is a way of sustaining a community's mindset, a community's self-identification, and a community's discussion about identity. Uh, we've been on a roll the last few years. In 2017, we acquired, uh, through the generosity of the Toby family, uh, the Arthur Schick collection, uh, pieces of which you see here photographically represented on the walls, but some original pieces of which you'll see in the Pièce de Résistance exhibition uh, in, the, in the main hall. Uh, this year, this, or this last year, 2018, uh, through the generosity of the Roman Vishniak family, uh, we received the donation of almost the entirety of the life production of a man, Roman Vishniak, who is arguably the greatest Judaica photographer of the 20th century. And that was a, uh, uh, such an exciting opportunity for us to integrate the Roman Vishniak archive into our collection and then down the line to create exhibitions based on it. And there's more to come. There's another donation that is in the works that can't yet be announced, but that is almost certain to be uh, realized. Uh, none of this really happens on its own. 
Uh, we're constantly in fundraising mode. So if you're inclined and able, please be as generous as possible in uh, donating to the Magnus. Uh, as for myself, um, my, my health has taken a turn, which is not life-threatening, but is debilitating. And so I have to step down as uh, director of the Magnus. I'll be passing the baton to someone who will be chosen sometime in the next two months. Uh, and, uh, but I will not be going away. I'll be uh, available to help guide and advise my successor as much as that successor is willing to listen. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and it has just been a privilege for me to have had these four years to contribute to this repository of cultural memory. To see, thank you. <laughs> to the, see the students and the faculty and the curatorial staff work together to help create exhibitions out of our permanent collection, to see members of the campus and off-campus communities enjoy, learn from, be inspired by what we present in terms of exhibitions based upon uh, our collection, and to see the, 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 the pride that our donors take. Many of them are listed here in this issue of uh, confluence toward the end. Uh, in, in this, the third largest Judaica collection in the United States, and the largest owned by any research university in the world. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Francesco Spagnolo, our curator extraordinaire. He is the conductor of everything we do, and tonight he is the MC for your program. Francesco. How much time do I have? Um, such a pleasure working with George. There you are. Thank you. Thank you for your words, for your guidance, your help, and for the work we did together that we're celebrating today. We're, we're in celebration mode tonight for two different projects. One is the uh, incredible gift of the Roman Vizniak Archive, and about that in a second. And we're also opening a new exhibition, which is a an important, I don't know whether turning point or closing of circles, uh, it's called Memory Objects, it's immediately behind all of you in, in our main gallery, and uh, offers a new take on the, on the, on the term Judaica. And um, we, we see Judaica in, in slightly different ways here, and we're helped in that, as George was saying, by the global mind of this incredible campus. Um, the Roman Vizniak archive arrived uh, on, a, on a truck from where it was stored in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Jersey City in, uh, in November. We're talking about, just to give you a sense, we're talking about circa 30,000 ima 30, images, uh, from negatives to contact prints to prints and uh, et cetera. But I, I would say what's even more important, more impressive uh, for us, and I, I can tell you, we, we even had like sort of like a a, a, a Thanksgiving cataloging party. There was so much excitement here that we all came in to, to work on that uh, uh, during the Thanksgiving uh, break. And, but what I, what's even more important than the, the amount and the, and the details of what's in the archive is that this is actually a total, what I, I call a total gift. Together with, uh, with uh, the archive, the generosity of our donors uh, included the full copyright, so the total control over the legacy of Roman Vizniak by the UC Berkeley campus. This is, uh, has almost incalculable uh, uh, consequences. We're still taking stock of that, and we know it because every day, not just every week, uh, my colleague uh, Julie Franklin, the registrar, the person who really makes sure that this collection is what it is, safe and accessible, and who is, I hope, somewhere in the, in the audience. I don't know, I can't see whether Julie's, there she is, she's hiding back there. She's, the, I think, the only person in the audience with purple hair, so you, you'll know who she is and you can thank her directly after, after we're done here. But in any case, um, um, Julie, Julie received, almost on a daily basis, multiple requests for releasing rights and publishing Roman Vishnik images across 
the world. You see a sample here. Um, of course, unprecedented resources by being here for the whole campus community. Uh, clearly, uh, Roman Vishnik's work on East European Jews augments our offerings in, uh, in Jewish studies and beyond. We already have a course planned for next year that will le leverage the archive. But also, and you see some glimpses be behind me in the slideshow, for the history of science. Uh, the one continuous activity of Roman Vizniak throughout his life as a photographer was actually documenting uh, the biological world from, from large to very, very small. And uh, we already have a partnership with the Center for the Study of the History of uh, Science and, and Medicine here on campus. I think it helps that the, that the director is also a fellow Milanese. Uh, no, that's not what helps. What helps is actually the fact that it's, uh, it's uh, the, the minute we started sharing these images and resources with colleagues on campus, like the collected jaw dropped and everybody was on board. We already have a, a team of, of graduate students in the history of science work, working with us weekly on these materials. And then all kinds of topics that will be mined uh, in the coming months and years, just in terms of uh, content. Uh, uh, Roman, and you, again, you have a glimpse of that here, but Roman Vizniak's work on, in Israel, color photography of Israel 1967, and his work in America that continues to focus on, on marginal and, and migrant communities. So there are very interesting points of continuity that we're exploring. Uh, but all of this was really, in a way, the dream, I can say, was, it was a very tangible dream of a very mighty lady. And Mara Vizhnia Kohn uh, left us, but left us with, with an incredible legacy just weeks after the materials arrived and, and were deposited here in Berkeley. So we were keeping her updated. Uh, she, was, she was ill at that time and passed away in, in, in Santa Barbara really shortly after the collection was secured at, at UC Berkeley. Uh, she was here speaking with us and with our students uh, two years ago. And um, it was really a dream of this incredible uh, person. Uh, before I acknowledge her children who are here with, with us tonight and we hear from them, I wanted to play a short video. Uh, Mara was here uh, um, in, in December of 2017. Uh, I, I went to her son's uh, home in Oakland. You will hear some construction noise on, in the background, but it was a time when we had just signed the, the agreement that would bring the, the archive to, to Berkeley, and it was the perfect time to actually ask her and have, in her own words, why she wanted this incredible legacy to be at UC Berkeley and at the Magnus. So hopefully the technology, the gods of technology will assist me and I will be able to, to play for you this short video. And uh, here we go. We were going to talk about the future of the collection, which is of course the main uh, goal right now and what we're looking forward to. But uh, the future uh, does start uh, way in the past when I was um, a girl of about nine and ten and from then on and uh, first saw these pictures emerge uh, in my father's uh, darkroom and uh, I was helping him. Uh, or he was letting me help uh, shake the trays for the developer. And so I, I saw these, the faces of the members of these communities immerse, emerge. And um, so in a way, I've always had some relationship to the collection, not only as my father's work, uh, but even as uh, uh, meeting these people themselves, which I never did, except through their images. And so, um, so most of the, uh, our decision now is a very recent decision, which meets my goals for the collection, which is to keep the work alive, and also in a way, keep uh, the people from dying again. And uh, that means we don't want them uh, really uh, hidden away in some archive that no one ever looks at. 
and where they're just uh, quote unquote stored, so to speak. But um, uh, the most um, uh, wonderful thing that I have been thinking about for years would be for young people to become uh, involved uh, both as photography uh, and uh, possibly with the experience of our Jewish family. So um, to find uh, a place that kind of sparkles with activity uh, and involves young people is uh, just uh, almost the fulfillment of a, uh, I hesitate to say a dream, but that comes to mind. So um, uh, I was really most interested and pleased and I had a feeling of maybe having arrived uh, at a new possibility when I first came to uh, Magnus and looked around and, and felt the spirit of the place. And uh, I was very excited about it and I'm more so now that it's become a real uh, possibility and I uh, see or hope anyway that uh, these materials and this includes uh, all of my father's efforts um, uh, will be uh, somehow connected with our present life and more importantly uh, with the lives of young people who will have some slight additional concept of um, these people, uh, my father uh, and his, I will use the word passionate work because he was passionate about everything in his life uh, and uh, passionate about his uh, scientific work and excited about it, uh, devoted to uh, uh, the Jewish material and felt even though he had ne never shared the life uh, that's shown in these uh, photographs, uh, he felt somehow very connected and referred to the people as our family. So uh, to find a not only safe but active place is just uh, wonderful for me and, and um, as some kind of, a, well, not my accomplishment, but a circumstance that developed that I see as so fortunate and as an arrival uh, as far as my stewardship is concerned uh, and a resting place but not a restful resting place uh, of this material. So I'm uh, excited, I'm thankful, I look forward to uh, having the knowledge that these people are safe and to some, some extent uh, alive and adding to our lives. I'm doing my own IT here, but uh, it's every time I hear these words, I'm really inspired, I have to say. Uh, at the end of this uh, short interview, she was like, was that okay? I was like, Mara, are you kidding me? Okay, doesn't even begin to explain this. And the same is true of Mara's uh, children, uh, Ben and Naomi, who are here with us tonight, who are real true partners in, in managing the future of this archive. So, uh, not only they live locally, but they, they are constant resources for us and, and of ideas and inspiration. And thank you, Professor Ben Schiff, for accepting my invitation to come and say a few words to all of us. So 
please welcome. Uh, ben uh, is uh, Professor Emeritus of uh, uh, Political Science at uh, Oberlin College and holds, I was told, a PhD from UC Berkeley. This, from this place this right place here, place right? This right place here, right here. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Well, I'm, I'm Ben Schiff, as, uh, as uh, Francesco told you, and I'm here with my sister Naomi Schiff, my elder, my, my dear elder and highly respected older sister, <coughs> excuse me, and, and I've been delegated to give this address, but I must say that Naomi is fully capable of uh, being as, as uh, useful in this regard as I. But we didn't want to take too much time. So we're, we're uh, two of Roman Vishniak's grandchildren. He had five grandchildren, four of whom uh, remain alive today. We have two Vishniak cousins in the East. Um, and so um, we're here, Naomi and I, to just say a little bit about Mara and, uh, and about Roman. Francesco recorded the video uh, when we were still engaged in the legal and logistical negotiations um, to move the archive from New York and New Jersey here. And that happened, um, or at least the, the key moment that in my mind was on October 26th of 2018 when I got an email, I think, from Francesco saying, the truck is loaded. <laughs> And Mara had signed the final formal papers for the donation at the, at the same time. Mara had been working for 30 years, uh, since before Roman passed in 1992, trying to sort out the complicated and messy details of his collections and his obligations and his legacy and his life. And Roman was an enormously energetic, charismatic, and messy individual, and there was just, there were loose ends everywhere. And she really, having had her own career in education and spending a lot of time with her very prominent husband, nonetheless uh, devoted the next 30 years of her life really to try to clean up and take care of, of all of that material. And you can see from the video that she didn't need prompting to explain uh, why she was donating the archive, and, and she was actually ecstatic. It's interesting watching the video, because she's, she's pretty well under control, but she was so delighted and so relieved that the material would be coming here that she was talking about it constantly, and it gave her enormous comfort and satisfaction uh, during the last months of her life. Um, and, and it was really a, a turning point for her. She felt that finally, after those 30 years of tying up loose ends, the biggest loose end, which I'm told constitutes about 30,000 items, that was finally taken care of. And it, and it was really a, a, a task that she carried out um, without much complaint and very assiduously, including bringing out three books of, of Roman's work after he died. Um, she visited here, as, as Francesco said, in 2017 and engaged in a conversation, I think, on this stage. And she was so happy to see the kind of engagement of the audience and the staff and was so kindly dealt with by Francesco that that was really the, the beginning of her decision to move the archive here. And as we embarked on that project, I have to admit that Naomi and I especially, and, and Mara with some discussion, were very prejudiced in favor of moving the archive to a public university. We had received suggestions about various wealthy private universities and other kinds of institutions, but we really wanted Roman's work to wind up where it was accessible to the widest possible constituencies of scholars and people and at all levels of engagement. And we, we really felt 
that a place, a, a public university, where people could be interested in his scientific side, the historical material, the Jewish cultural material, that was the place to be. And Naomi and I, I think I'm, I can speak for her as well as myself, we really feel kind of smug that we're here uh, with our grandfather's material at the greatest public university in the world. And we just... <laughs> and almost as smug because we both live in Oakland. <laughs> Naomi graduated from UC San Diego as I think part of the second graduating class. I studied here um, in the 70s and got a PhD while George was in the Department of Political Science. Uh, Mara's second husband, the late Walter Cohn, was a professor at UC San Diego when Naomi was there but before he met Mara. Naomi reported to Mara on Walter later. To, he was an okay guy. And Mara and her husband Walter Cohn moved to UC Santa Barbara in the late 70s when he became the founding director of the University of California Institute for Theoretical Physics, now called the Kavli Institute of Theoretical Physics. Roman's range of interests was enormous, including pre-war Jewish shtetl life in Eastern Europe, photography generally, Asian art, evolution and the history of science and its precursor, alchemy, the development of photography and the development of microscopes. His longest lasting passion was learning about, understanding, identifying with, I think, and taking pictures of living microscopic creatures, which he considered to be not primitive, but extremely highly evolved. Naomi and I share Mara's delight that the full range of Roman's work will be available here for the students and scholars of the UC system and the public at large. And we thank George Breslauer and Francesco Spagnolo Julie Franklin and their wonderful colleagues for the enthusiasm and the care that they took in bringing the archive here and now working to put it in order. And as Francesco said, yeah, it's not an archive yet, it's a collection. Um, you remember the mess that was in the apartment? It, well, it moved, but it didn't get a whole lot better. And for the first time now, uh, it will be put in serious order so that it will be accessible and usable by all those people we hope will maintain interest. Tom Schroeder and Nima Katz in the Office of the University's General Counsel were fabulous in the exacting negotiations that made this all work. So we're, we're just thrilled that it's here. It's, it's really moving to see Mara now uh, just uh, shortly after her passing and remember how happy she was, and we thank you for your support. Wow. So, in thinking about gathering today and celebrating and thanking Mara and Naomi and Ben, notice the order. Um, we end, end opening a new exhibition called Memory Objects, and clearly this is all a collection of memory objects and beyond. But uh, thinking about the role of collections such as the Magnus and these objects that are usually referred to as Judaica, uh, that actually came together often uh, because of uh, uh, people and groups moving, and especially the 20th century collections were the result of the great refugee crisis uh, that followed World War I and the, the fall of the Russian and Austro-Hungarian and Ottoman empires. Uh, in, in thinking about all of this uh, and putting together a new exhibition that as you will see and I hope you'll have a chance to see includes work by students and the work of our staff, the same people who moved this collection including our preparator Ernest Jolly who I hope is uh, with us right now, uh, uh, who, who wrapped every single photo. Uh, 280 something uh, 
boxes of the Vizniak archive so that they would arrive here safely are also the same people that make the exhibitions here happen. And so the work is, is day in, day out, our, our work. So in thinking about all this, we were very fortunate that some kind of circle started closing. Uh, the idea for the exhibition memory object came after a conversation with uh, uh, our dean, Tony Cascardi, and his uh, uh, fantastic partner, Jennifer Howard, who uh, said, what about doing something around the hair with ember eyes, a book that was dear to all of us? And, uh, and so here now we have an exhibition around that, but also it, it, it pro a project that came out of a of a, a new course uh, funded by the Digital Humanities on Mapping Diasporas, for which we interviewed refugees recently relocated to the Bay Area about their own memory objects and how they relate to the homes that they left behind and then in some cases are no more. Uh, so in, in all of this, one circle closed in conversation with a new and important friend of ours, Tom Freudenheim, uh, a person who has had and continues to have an incredible role and a distinguished role in the, in the development of, of uh, museums and museum culture in this country, and uh, who was our colleague before we were here. He, Tom was, uh, came from the Jewish Museum in New York uh, to Berkeley to open the Berkeley Art Museum, essentially, and then moved on to a career that included Smithsonian and, and uh, National Endowment for the Arts, and, and now a career of being a feisty commentator, both uh, in online and on paper and, and on his Facebook feed, which you should follow. And if you're in the museum world, you fear, like. <laughs> um, in any case, Tom uh, also uh, descends from uh, a, a, a gentleman by the name of Ernst Freundenheim, who, who was a, for part of his life in Berlin in the 1920s, a dealer of Judaica. And uh, we realized that at least one item from the inventory of his father was in the collection we were looking at. And uh, very kindly, Tom donated his father's photo inventory. Nowadays, dealers have websites. At the time, they had photo albums. So uh, you'll see the photo album displayed in, in, in the gallery. And uh, with a little bit of trepidation, I invited him to speak. And then I let him, when he said yes, I let him steam. And at some point, he emailed me, and I think he may, may even have called me, which is something that these days nobody does anymore, right? And, and, and I said, so what do you want me to talk about? And, and, and I said, well, I don't know what I want you to talk about, but I do have a title for you. <laughs> and, and the title is Collecting Jewish Objects in Times of Crisis. And when I said this, Tom paused, was the phone, and then laughed, but just a little bit, and said, yeah, I can talk about that. So it's with great pleasure, a little bit of trepidation, that I welcome Tom Freudenheim to the podium and to the Magnus. And, and it's a family story that, uh, that, continues, uh, that continues here. And I will be your IT person, so help me. Thank you, Tom. And how do I change them? I will do it. Okay. You're going to do it? Yeah, oh, no, it's fine, but I don't, you know. Um, uh, I'm, I'm really, I don't know what the trepidation is about, but, um, but, I, but I'm really happy to be here. And um, uh, Professor Breslauer started out by saying it's the third uh, most important Judaica collection in the United States. It's actually, that may be in size, but actually it's the most important Judaica collection in the United States because it's the only... Jewish, the Magnus is really the only Jewish museum um, that's now really seriously engaged in using collections, studying them um, curatorially in a scholarly way, and um, it's, you know, I'm, I'm not happy to say that because there are other Jewish museums around, um, but I know a lot about them and I can tell you that um, there's no place like the Magnus um, and its work. So um, I tell you that you, you chose well, um, Mara chose well, and I, um, and I have to say also that I have vivid recollection of meeting Roman Vishniak several times um, when I was a young curator at the Jewish Museum in the early 1960s, and he was trying to get somebody interested in his work, and it was, I mean, he was very, as you already heard, he was very memorable, very imposing figure, not just because of his bald head, which I didn't have in those days. Um, his was better than mine anyway. But um, he was just so interesting because, on the one hand, there was all this 
um, material about the, this lost Jewish past. But on the other hand, what he really wanted me to know about and showed me a lot of were the scientific photographs, um, the biological stuff about which I knew nothing at all. And so I, but but they were you know they were just visually um, engaging, and um, that was before you know he became famous and iconic. Um, but I have very and I was too low on the totem pole to be able to. Uh, to help promote him in any way, but I do have very vivid and fond recollection of uh, spending time with him when I was um, uh, just a kid. Um, I also want to say that I'm particularly happy to be here. Um, I have a long association with the Magnus. Um, Seymour Frummer was a, both somebody I admired greatly, but also a personal friend, and um, I was peripherally involved when I lived in Berkeley with things going on at the Magnus. Um, and my, um, my father knew Seymour, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about my father, and my mother-in-law, Eleanor Mandelson, uh, was a volunteer at the Magnus. She actually did the oral history with Seymour, and she was also a great admirer of his. So um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of personal uh, reasons for me being very happy to be here. Um, and um, I'm real, I, when, when Francesco told me about the Vishniak collection coming here, I was over the moon because it was just, it is the perfect, uh, it is the perfect repository. So um, I'm really, really glad about that. Um, I want to start my little talk with a poem by the famous, um, the wonderful um, Israeli poet Yehuda Amichai. A collection of ritual objects in the museum. Spice boxes with little flags on top like festive troops and many fragrant generations of sacrifice and the memory of many Sabbath nights that did not end in death. And happy menorahs and weepy menorahs and oil lamps with the pouting beaks of chicks like children singing, their mouths open in desire and love. And long metal hands to point out everything that is no more. The human hands that held them, long since underground, severed from the bodies. Seder plates that rotate at the speed of time so it seems they are standing still and kiddish cups in a row on the shelf like soccer trophies or victory cups from the track and field of generations. All is gold of grief, silver of longing, copper of calamity. A collection of ritual objects like the gaudy toys of a baby god, the gift of an aged nation, like the strange instruments of a ghost orchestra, like some odd motionless bottom fish deep in the waters of time. A collection of ritual objects donated by Dr. Feuchtwanger, Jerusalem dentist. And whoever hears this will assume a delicate smile on his lips, like well-wrought filigree. Dr. Heinrich Feuchtwanger was a dentist who arrived in Jerusalem in 1936, having begun his Judaica collection um, earlier in Munich, um, probably a decade earlier. I believe he was a a uh, client of my father's, but I have not been able to put all the pieces together yet. But when I saw this Amichai poem, it kind of freaked me out. I thought it was so wonderful. I had to share it with you. Um, first slide. Um, this is the album cover. We want to see it because the album is open on display. And you can see it's just a nice art, de an art deco cover of my father's album for his inventory. He was um, uh, an, Judea an art dealer primarily with Judaica, but not exclusively with Judaica, in Berlin in the late 1920s. Um, it was a time when he was married to his first wife, not my mother, and therefore he never spoke a whole lot about it. So it's unfortunate I don't have a, uh, a history in depth, although I have the inventory, the, op the um, photographs, and many negatives that, um, that are, of which there are not, there are no positives, but they can be uh, researched and can be done. Uh, next, please. This is the title page of, of um, my dad's um, uh, album, and um, you can see the December 31st, um, 1929. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting um, time, okay, because where, what, was he, what was he doing with Judaica then? Well, if you think about it, it was after World War I, there were huge numbers of refugees coming into Germany um, from, especially from Poland, and um, he, my father was very well connected with uh, a well-known 
uh, artist next, um, named Hermann Struck, who lived, they, they both lived in the same building. This is Brooklyn Alley. It's a build, building, it was, the entire area was bombed by the, by, um, the American bombers in, in 1945, so it doesn't exist at all anymore. But it was a very elegant neighborhood. Struck was, uh, had personal uh, wealth, although he was a, a prominent artist. He was, in fact, um, the dean of printmaking and published a number of books on printmaking. And he is the man who taught Marc Chagall printmaking when Chagall came to Berlin for his first solo, uh, solo exhibition in 1914. Um, and he met Struck, and Struck sort of instructed him on how to make prints. And we're all the beneficiaries of. Um, Chagall's prints, although there's lots of Struck prints, and the Magnus has a number of them, um, and, uh, but he's just not as well known. Next, please. Um, this, is, uh, this is Herman Struck, uh, just a photograph next. Um, an etching of him, um, and he made, he was, his etchings are extraordinary, and he made my father's bar mitzvah present, which is a book plate that my dad gave to Seymour Frummer. I don't know, I didn't look at the date on the accession thing, but um, that, that's been in the Magnus Museum for a while. Um, and so my dad was already kind of um, uh, interested in what was going on um, in Berkeley. Um, next, please. Well, this is my father. Um, uh, it turns out, I, it, this was hidden in the attic. I don't remember ever seeing it with my father. I think I probably found it after my dad uh, passed away. I'm not really sure. It was never framed or anything. It's now framed and sits in front of me on my desk in New York. But um, uh, interestingly, it was uh, done on the date on the, in the corner. It's my father's 25th birthday. So he was a young fellow when he was doing this kind of stuff. And um, Struck was his kind of godfather. My grandfather was much, was a great deal older. He died in 1926 um, and was not young when he died. Um, and I think Struck was sort of a surrogate father. He was also, an Orthodox, he was an Orthodox Jew, what we would today call modern Orthodox. Um, and so, you know, to a young, a young man who, uh, who has a kind of role model, I think Struck was very important to my father. And um, he became, Struck was a very close friend of Theodore Herzl's and uh, did lots of portraits of Herzl, was a big Zionist, uh, attended the first Zionist Congress. Um, and um, moved to Palestine in 1924, kept his Berlin apartment um, because he did my grandfather's death mask in 1926 in Berlin. So he was, going, he, he was going back and forth. He died in 1944 in Haifa, and his home is a museum in Haifa right now. But anyway, my dad appears to have gotten connected to all this Judaica via Hermann Struck, who was connecting him probably to refugees. Struck knew a lot about the um, Eastern European Jews. Um, I, he was in some way represented the interests of Polish Jewry at the Versailles Peace Conference. He was kind of, because he was, he wasn't just an arty artist, he was a man of, of great means, and so he was able to um, get around a lot. Um, this Torah, look at this Torah crown here, and then next you'll, you'll see the actual Torah crown from my father's um, album. Um, and next, please. There's the album page it's on, you see, he sold it. It says, it says verkauft. Um, so he sold these two things. Um, the uh, crown on your right, um, <laughs> on your right, um, next please, um, appeared, uh, eventually went into um, my uncle's collection, um, which again, coming full circle to where we are today, um, ended up residing in San Francisco um, on Lion and Vallejo, and the big mansion on Lion and Vallejo, where um, I remember seeing it. There's somewhere, I haven't been able to find it, there's a photograph of the little museum room, the Judaica museum room um, that he had. But my uncle sold the collection at um, um, Park Burnett, which is now Sotheby's, in 1950. Um, next, please. 
and you can see what happens to these objects. Um, it, it's in the Jewish Museum now, and at some point, um, I don't know when, a bird was added to the top of it. Um, that fo this beautiful photograph, compared to the others, you see, is from uh, the Jewish Museum in New York. The, the, um, and it's online, you know, uh, easy, easy to find. So it, it becomes a very a kind of splendid object. Um, uh, next, please. Another piece that's in my father's album, but the, the page isn't turned to it. And I was thrilled to see that one of the, one of the other pages in the exhibition, the page that's, that the album is open to, shows a photograph of a small plate that's in the Magnus collection that's in a case nearby. So I thought that was just terrific. Um, um, this is the earliest, I believe, the earliest known Torah breastplate. It's from Bohemia, no, 1651. It's dated, um, and which is also not, um, doesn't frequently happen. It was originally in the cemetery in Friedberg in Bavaria. So, um, you know, this wasn't clearly an object that came from some Polish Jew selling, you know, coming out of, out of uh, the East to sell it to my father. So I have no idea, you know, it's too bad we don't know. Um, uh, where it came from, um, but it's sorry, 1669. It's much early. It's it's early. It's really anyway. It, it ended up my uncle's collection. Next, please, um, and then eventually ended up after the sale at uh, in 1950. Ended up at the Jewish Museum in New York. This is also um, a photo photo from the Jewish Museum's uh, website. Um, I'm going to move away from not. This is not a trip down memory lane about my father's collection. I'm just using it as a jumping off point. Um, but I will say that this. I'm thrilled to have this material here because, again, somebody can use it, look at it. It's not display material. It's really archival material. It has no. It, you know, has no. Um, value to put in the case except in an exhibition like this. But if you want to do research, provenance research, you, you want to know that objects were at a certain place at a certain time, which is what people study, um, this will be interesting material. And um, so I'm, I'm delighted uh, that, that it's, uh, and I asked my kids and they were, they were happy to have it here. And interestingly, uh, both of my kids also know the Magnus, so I was, my sons were very happy because they, they, th they think well of the Magnus too. Your, your, your curator's back here, so you can't see him smiling. Anyway, um, <laughs> next please. Um, this is a spice tower from, uh, was Fra from Frankfurt from the mid 16th century. It was restored in the 17th century, um, which we know because there's a little inscription on it. Um, it's, not a very, um, it's not a very good photograph because I, I took it from a book. Um, what's interesting about it is that it was in the Jewish Museum in Frankfurt, and it's now in the Jewish Museum in New York. Um, when I was a young curator at the time when I was, um, Shall I say, fending off Roman Vishniak, who thought I could help him get an exhibition in the museum, but I couldn't. Um, anyway, but I had a great time sitting around talking to him. Um, but in those days, um, the Jewish Museum very proudly had on its labels, formerly in the Jewish Museum Frankfurt. Um, we're talking the early 1960s. Um, it's still on display at the Jewish Museum in New York. Maybe, I don't know, they don't show a lot of Judaica, but, um, but they sure don't say formerly in the Jewish Museum Frankfurt anymore. Um, and that raises questions, and I'm really, this, the rest of my talk is about, about questions, maybe ethical questions. I'm not giving answers, I'm just posing them to you, to, things for you to think about, which relate to the exhibition, I think, in some way. Um, uh, there is a Jewish Museum in Frankfurt right now. Um, and so you, you guys are reading newspaper all the time about returning art that's been stolen from here, there, and everywhere, and Holocaust-related art, and the Washington principles, and all this stuff. I'm sure there's a number of people here who are up on that. Anyway, um, this never seems to come up, um, and that's because the Germans don't have the nerve to ask for it back, is my theory. Um, um, but. And I've actually, I said to the, he's no longer the director, but you know, years ago when I was with the director um, of the museum in Frankfurt, you know, why don't you ask for this stuff back? And he said, oh, well, you know, we can't really do that. Um, next, please. Um, the most, uh, this is a, a not good, I'll show you a better photograph in a minute. Um, this is a gold Kiddish cup, um, also uh, from 
also from Frankfurt. Um, it's about 1600. Uh, the, it's inscribed, the date is inscribed 1650. Um, and it was the most beautiful gold Kiddush cup anywhere um, in any museum. And it, next please. Um, it, you, here you can see it um, in a photograph that I had to get from a book. Um, why did I have to get it from a book? Because it's not on the Jewish Museum's website anymore. It used to be, but it was stolen in the 1980s. Um, something that's quite quiet, and um, I, not totally quiet, because there, there were police reports and stuff, but for me, it's the equivalent of the Vermeer and other paintings that were stolen from the Gardner Museum in Boston, which you read about a lot, okay? Um, but there's no, no fuss was ever made about it. I only, no, I only found out about this about 10 years ago when, I, when we moved to New York and, and I was going through the museum. I thought, where the hell is that gold cup? And then I asked the curator, he said, oh, it was stolen about 20 years ago. And I said, you're kidding. And anyway, so um, that's how objects, you know, move around, let's say. <laughs> um, um, and, uh, and, and, you know, we, we, I mean, those of us who are Jewish, not me, but a lot of people spend a lot of time doing hand-wringing about all the things that other people, uh, you know, other people have done. But uh, this is kind of a self-inflicted wound, in my opinion. Um, next, please. Uh, particularly beautiful, it's not, I couldn't find, because, because it's not online anymore, I couldn't find a good slide. That's a unicorn, I'm not sure you can see it, but it has the unicorns now and then appear in Jewish objects, um, and especially German ones in the 16th and 17th century, not so much in the 18th century. And it was one of the most beautiful things was this unicorn. Can't find a good picture of it because the, the books that have it didn't, didn't photograph that side of it, the, the, the books that have good photographs. Um, and as I say, the Jewish Museum, they probably have good photographs, but I was unable to obtain them. Um, next, please. Uh, that's, this also, I should say, you can, you can leave this, but the, Kiddush, the gold Kiddush cup also was in the Jewish Museum in Frankfurt. And just imagine if it had been returned to the Jewish Museum in Frankfurt, it might not have been stolen in New York. <laughs> So, um, what can I say? Uh, here's a here's a Hanukkah uh, um, Hanukkah lamp, um, which is actually signed by the by the um, silversmith Johann Heinrich Philipp Schott. Um, it's 19th century, about 1850. Um, was also in the Jewish Museum in Frankfurt, and was is now in the Skirball Museum um, in Los Angeles, which. Surely one or another of you has been to. Um, and again, I, I gave a talk, not this talk, but another, I, I never do the same talk twice, don't worry. Um, I um, gave a talk maybe 10 years ago to a group of Judaica collectors in um, LA, and I you know, was discussing this lamp, which is very precious to the, um, to the Skirball Museum, because it, comes from, it, was, it was given by the Rothschild family, and you know, Rothschild is like, you know, this magic name, right? So um, it's the Rothschild lamp. So um, when I said, I, I said, you know, it was once in the Jewish Museum in Frankfurt, and the lady stood up and said, I'm a docent at the Skirball Museum. Are you telling me that we should give this back to Germany? And I said, I'm not telling you anything. I don't, I, I don't have an opinion on this subject. I'm just saying that you're on the paper, it happened to where I was speaking, was right down the street. You know, LACMA, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, is being vilified right now because they apparently have two or three paintings that, you know, were stolen Holocaust works. And it's all over the papers and everybody's, you know, making demons out of the staff at LACMA. And this is sitting in the, in the Skirball Museum. I, you know, it's not up to me to say what should happen to it. Um, another such example, next please. Um, but this is a, a big example. This is the Danzig collection. Here's a catalog um, from 1980, which was done at the Jewish Museum in New York when, during one of the um, hiatuses when the Jewish Museum in New York was still doing major Judaica exhibitions. Um, and next, please. This is the catalog of the Danzig collection from Danzig. Danzig is now Gdansk in Poland. 
Um, you can get lectures on it from Professor Breslauer here, I'm sure. Um, anyway, um, when, when World War II started, when, when Poland was invaded, the, um, the Jewish community of Danzig uh, sent a collection to the Jewish Theological Seminary, uh, which, which had a Judaica collection, which eventually became what is now the Jewish Museum in New York. But, but at the time, the Jewish Museum hadn't been established yet. So they sent their collection to the Jewish Theological Seminary with the uh, uh, understanding that it would be returned uh, if a Jewish community was established in Danzig within 15 years. Um, anyway, so it's still at the Jewish Museum in New York. Next, please. Um, here you can see the photograph from the catalog. Uh, and look at the piece on your right, uh, the Torah curtain on your right. Next, please. Here it is at the Jewish Museum in New York. That's again from their website. It's a beautiful piece. Um, next, please. Um, here's the synagogue in, in Danzig, the great synagogue that housed the, um, uh, the collection. That's again from the catalog. Next, please. Um, you know, see the inside. Next. And here you can see that this catalog, of which I showed you the cover a couple of images ago, was published April 1933. Now remember, Hitler uh, took power in J January 1933. So in April 1933, the Danzig community was publishing, proudly publishing, this catalog, which has um, a lot of photographs that I'm not showing you, but it's, it's an illustrated uh, catalog of their collection. That collection went to, the Jewish Muse went to the Jewish Theological Seminary. When I worked at the Jewish Museum, it was, the, it was called the Danzig Collection. Um, it was early 60s. Um, you know, the situation in behind the, behind the so-called Iron Curtain was, was what it was then, which is not what it is now, maybe becoming that again. But anyway, um, um, I met people from the Jewish community of Danzig, um, and again, sort of like the, the Frankfurt uh, gentleman that I spoke to, although they weren't museum people, um, I asked them if they knew about the Danzig collection, and they said, yeah, of course. And I said, well, how come you didn't ask for it back? Well, because the, you know, the, it was supposed to be a 15-year period, and you know, we, don't, we don't have any you know, case to make, blah, blah. And I thought again, um, the statute of limitations on stolen art in relationship to the Holocaust, you know, isn't, I mean, there's not, there's, there's nobody considering a statute of limitations. The, the, the courts are constantly coming up with these issues. And, I'm, and I don't think that's wrong. I don't think it's bad. But in the Judaica field, it has not come up. And it's very interesting because a lot of the material that's sitting probably even in the Magnus, but certainly in, in um, a lot of the Jewish museums is traceable to Jewish museums that didn't exist then that do exist now. Um, now they are different legal entities, but that's again what, you know, in, in Talmudic studies you call pill pull. Um, it's just, uh, you know, dancing on, uh, angels dancing on, on the heads of pins. Um, I worked at the Jewish Museum in Berlin, for example, um, which some of you may have visited, uh, the, new, the new Daniel Liebeskin building, and um, it is a different legal entity from the Jewish Museum in Berlin that um, opened in, amazingly, January 1933 and was closed after Kristallnacht. Um, yes, it is a different legal entity, but in fact, there's a sort of legal entity called the Centrum Judaicum in Berlin, which could be considered the successor organization to the Jewish Museum of the 1930s. So, you know, but none, the Jewish area just doesn't get touched um, when it comes to legal things and, um, and lawsuits. Um, and I find that, again, I'm not, I'm not making um, judgments on, I'm laying it before you so you can think about um, how complicated it is when you look at this material. Next, please. Um, here's a Torah crown that's not, um, you know, particularly, uh, doesn't look as wonderful as it, is, as it is in this photograph. It's now in the Victoria and Albert Museum um, in London. It's about yay big. It's, the jewels are real, or most of the jewels are, are, are real. It's extraordinary piece. Um, it was purchased 
<coughs> it was purchased um, by auction and then dealer um, in the early, um, late 1990s by Arthur Gilbert, um, a Los Angeles uh, collector, not of Judaica, but of uh, decorative arts. Um, for his museum in London, of which I was briefly uh, the director. And then the museum folded into, well, the collection is, is now at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And this piece is on, I think is on permanent display in, at the v and um, It's an interesting piece because it's gold. There are very few gold objects, clearly, in the Judaica field. Um, there are a lot of gilded objects, but not a lot of gold objects. Um, it has a wonderful history. It's supposedly in, um, nobody's quest. Nobody's said this isn't true. Although I don't, I don't know that anybody knows that it's that it's proof. But it belonged to the Ruzhiner rabbi, um, Israel Ruzhin, who was a Hasidic um, rabbi in the 19th century in Ukraine, and he was known for the splendor of his court. As you know, um, a lot of these um, rabbis were had real, real courts where where people. Um, you know, almost bowed down to them. Um, but um, he was, had, he was, had a lot of trouble. He was, you know, it was Ukraine back and forth, lots of ways. Um, he eventually ended up um, in uh, Bukovina in a place called Sadegora. Next, please. Um, where, they, where they built, his followers built him this palace. Um, so, which is why the idea that he had a Torah crown doesn't, a gold Torah crown doesn't seem, for traveling, I mean, it clearly was made, wasn't made for synagogue, it was, you know, um, would fit into his Samsonite case. Um, and so, uh, and it says, this is from, a, this is an old postcard, you know, greetings from Sadagora, the palace of the great rabbi, okay? So, in other words, calling it a palace is not, you know, is, that's okay. Uh, we don't we don't think of well I don't think of our rabbis that way maybe you do but um, um, but it's a it's really interesting and and I don't I don't know that this set sect actually still exists um, but somehow or other the you know things got on the market eventually and it was a gold piece and it it stayed um, intact and now it's in the Victorian Albert Museum so that's great next please um, another of my stories this is a <coughs> this is a church um, on East 4th Street in New York, formerly the Lemberger Shul, people from the city of Lemberg, Lviv, Lviv, um, which was a great Jewish community, um, where I actually visited a couple years ago. Um, this is what it looks like now. Um, you can't get in, it's locked. The telephone number that's on the sign doesn't answer. Anyway, next please. Um, and this is the upper part, and next please. That's you know, so you can see what it is. It's a, it's a Puerto Rican um, church, Baptist church. Next. This is the interior of that um, in 1964 um, when I was still at the Jewish Museum and the minister of the congregation that had purchased the uh, synagogue called the Jewish Museum and asked um, whether we wanted anything in it because they were about to renovate it and turn it into a church. So I went running down um, and our our museum photographer uh, came and took um, a couple of photographs. Uh, I'm sorry that we didn't do more of them, but what you can see is beautiful scenes of the Holy Land that were painted on the walls. I don't think they were frescoes, but uh, it's unclear, and I just don't remember well enough. But on uh, all sides, there were, there were beautiful paintings. And then this ark, it wasn't a very, it was, you know, maybe half the size of this room, but it wasn't a very big place, but it was really quite beautiful. And, um, so I got somebody to take down the, the ark decoration, and as I say, I got the photographer to take pictures of it, and we, um, but the Jewish Museum wasn't interested. Again, I was in Peonsville. Um, and so I, we put it, the ark decoration in storage, and eventually a collector um, from Cleveland um, got, I got friendly with, and I, he knew about this, and I said, you can have it if you pay the storage charges. And, um, you know, because I was, I was personally liable for the storage charges because the museum wouldn't, 
wouldn't pay for them. Um, and so this guy, Joe Hurwitz, took it to Cleveland, where he had it on display in his home for a while. Eventually, his whole collection went to the B'nai B'rith Museum in Washington, DC, the B'nai B'rith Klutznik Museum, which no longer hasn't been around for about 15 or 20 years. And that collection was in storage. And um, two or three years ago, was given to the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, and is now um, part of the Skirball Museum in Cincinnati. Um, so, next please. So this little piece of um, trivia from early 20th, late 19th, early 20th century from the Lemberger Shul is now in Cincinnati, and I'm glad at least a little piece of that got uh, saved. I did go, the reason I have those photographs of the exterior from a few months ago is because I went in there, I went to try to get in, I wanted to find out if they saved the paintings, what happened to the marble plaques on the back that had, you know, the memorial plaques forever, right? Um, and um, I, I've not been, so far not been able to get in. The Chinese um, stores next to it didn't know anything about it, wouldn't talk to me, so um, I'm still hoping I can find out what, what got in there. Next, please. Um, and here's a, a, a nice story, okay? And this is uh, from, um, this is a Torah ark from um, Sioux City, Iowa. And it was given, um, it was given to, uh, they know the maker, his name was Abraham Sulk Shulkin, he was a Russian. Um, it was, uh, when the synagogue was being take, was taken down, the Jewish Federation of Sioux City gave it to the Jewish Museum in New York, where it now, um, is residing. I'm not sure it's on display, but at least it's saved, you know, for somebody to uh, have at some point. And it is on their website from which this photo comes, so um, it's not entirely lost. But that's a kind of good story where a community uh, knows that they have something that ought to be uh, taken care of, because a lot of these things have basically been destroyed. They're, you know, a lot of small towns not that Sioux City is a small town, but a lot of small towns had lovely synagogues and nobody knew what to do with the material and they just, um, they just got um, thrown away, basically. Um, and next, my, my final example, if you will. Um, these are a pair of Torah finials, Rimonim, uh, by Meyer Myers, um, one of the great silversmiths of the uh, colonial period, um, a colleague of Paul Revere. Um, although I don't think he did a midnight ride. Um, um, they, come, they were made um, in about um, 1760s to 70s um, uh, for the um, Mikveh Israel Synagogue, the Sephardic Synagogue in Philadelphia. Um, and they're still in use in Philadelphia. They're extraordinarily beautiful. They lend them for exhibitions now and then, uh, but they're still in use um, in Philadelphia uh, by uh, Mikveh Israel. Next, please. Um, and then finally, um, these are another pair of finials by the same silversmith, Meyer Myers, uh, that were made for the Turo Synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island, um, which is kind of a great historic um, um, building in Newport. The synagogue had, had many ups and downs. It was a Sephardic synagogue. It's now an Ashkenazic synagogue. And this photograph shows the, um, the Rimonim on display at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, um, where, where I don't know whether they're still on display, but where they were on display. The Boston Museum of Fine Arts um, tried to buy them uh, because the Turo Synagogue in Newport um, didn't have any money, and, and it's a, you know, just maintaining the synagogue. The, the, it is a National Historic uh, Property. It's, it's on the National Reg Historic Reg Register of Historic Places, designed by Peter Harrison. It's a very important building, um, and it's, they just don't have the money to take care of it. So they wanted to sell the Rimonim, um, well, this is four or five years ago, for what was that, what then was, really would have been the record price for Judaica, $7 million. Um, and uh, then Sheriff Israel, the Sephardic synagogue in New York, um, uh, took them to court because they had legal kind of ownership over the Newport synagogue. And they took the Newport synagogue to court and said they couldn't sell the Rimonim. And um, the, uh, the first court case, the, well, the, the lower court uh, said they could. And then it went to appeals, to appeals court, and the, um, um, the opinion that 
turned it around that said that they could not sell the uh, Rimo name to the Boston Museum. Uh, the, um, uh, the opinion was written by Justice Souter, um, who sided with the New York synagogue, not based on feelings or anything like that, but based on, on legal documents that had been signed in terms of turning ownership of the Newport Synagogue over, uh, over to New York. So um, I don't know what the status of this is. I, I don't know whether, um, you know, the idea that, there's, that these really valuable things are, are, using, are being used in Newport every Shabbat, um, I doubt it, um, because, because a price has been published you know, publicized. Um, so they may, for all I know, they may be locked up, or maybe uh, they're graciously still in this case at the MFA in Boston. I haven't been there lately. Um, what I really wanted to give you a sense of is that when you look at these objects in, in this lovely little exhibition next door, um, there, there are lots of layers. And, and you know, there, it's not just looking at them and thinking, oh, who might have owned this? And, you know, is this person dead? Did this person perish in the Holocaust or whatever? But the layers of, of hands that, have, that, that things have gone through um, are complicated. And one of the things that's important about a place like the Magnus is that um, you can focus on that. You can, you can take time to look at it and think about it and, and all these different dimensions, especially because it's, especially because it's at UC Berkeley and it's part of the university system. Um, it's not just the, you know, my guess is that nobody in the art history department really will come and look at it, but I can imagine lots and lots of other people in lots of other departments at the university will uh, use the resources of the Magnus. And maybe, maybe even somebody in the history of art, um, which, you know, they have, they have a very good department, um, or they did when I, when I worked here. Um, and it would be nice to think that, that, um, that there's food for study, you know, in all of these disciplines. But it's one of the reasons this place is really special. And I hope you people who are lucky enough to have it and live with it uh, realize that. And um, uh, I'm not the fundraiser, but you should support it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, George. And uh, there is still time to Enjoy the exhibition, and thank you, everybody, for coming and joining us tonight. Thank you. <laughs>